War is a complex business. It only takes one simple error to be made for total disaster, from the failure of a military campaign to even the killing of one's own troops and allies. Known today as friendly fire, these tragic and fatal mistakes can be found throughout the whole of recorded history, and despite advancements in technology and military communication, still occur today. In today's episode, we're going to examine five cases of friendly fire during one of the most devastating periods in history, World War II. Welcome to Wars of the World. On September 6, 1939, the war was in its third day for the people of Great Britain, and at this very early juncture, fraying nerves were more of a threat than the enemy. For the people of Britain, the war began with a series of false alarms, as the fear of German airplanes raining death upon British cities, as they had done during the Spanish Civil War in Spain, seemed to hang over every conversation like a dark grey cloud. Such concerns were not confined to the civilian population either, for the fighter pilots of the Royal Air Force's Fighter Command were now beginning to feel the weight of the burden placed upon their shoulders in defending the British Isles. This pressure and paranoia would lead to a tragic event unfolding that day. The exact details surrounding the incident that took place remain contested. Known as the Battle of Barking Creek, the event involves the scrambling of British fighters to pursue a German formation that was picked up on radar flying over West Mercy, Essex. Hawker Hurricane and Supermarine Spitfire fighters went after the enemy planes, but unknown to them, two RAF pilot officers, Montague Holton Harrop and Frank Rose, had taken off in their own hurricanes to join their comrades. As the Spitfires and Hurricanes scoured the sky, looking for the Luftwaffe planes, a flight of Spitfires from No. 74 Squadron identified two German fighters and turned in to attack. Of course, these were not German planes. They were the late Hurricanes. Both aircraft received fatal hits from the Spitfires' Browning machine guns before their pilots realized the terrible mistake. Pilot officer Frank Rose managed to bail out of his stricken hurricane, but Montague Holton Harrop received a bullet in the back of his skull, killing him instantly and leaving his body strapped in the hurricane as it fell to earth, crashing at Manor Farm Hintlesham in Suffolk. Spitfire pilots John Freeborn and Paddy Byrne were both court-martialed for the incident, however much of the trial remains covered up. Both men continued to serve in the RAF, with Byrne being shot down over France less than a year later being captured and then held in a prisoner of war camp. Freeborn, on the other hand, would go on to have a highly distinguished career as an airman, clocking up more combat hours than any other pilot in the Battle of Britain and downing over 13 German planes. He rose to the rank of wing commander and was decorated with the Distinguished Flying Cross, but admitted later in life that he thought about Hulton Harrop every day, his guns having been the ones that killed him. As for Frank Rose, he would be tragically killed over France on May 18, 1940. This event highlights a number of deficiencies in the RAF's defenses in the early days of the war, some being technical and some operational. Suspicion persists that the RAF officer leading the Spitfires, South African Adolf Malin, lied during the court-martial regarding his involvement in the incident, and it is known that this was a key part of Freeborn's defense. Either way, Malin would become one of the RAF's top aces of the war, something that has long overshadowed his involvement in the incident. Perhaps the final tragic part to this story is that Hulton Harrop's death would prove completely unnecessary, for it was later discovered there were no German aircraft in the skies over West Mercy that day. A technical malfunction in the radar set had produced a false image on the scopes. As well as being the first RAF pilots to die in World War II, Holton Harrop and Frank Rose's Hurricanes were also the first aircraft shot down by the Spitfire. On April 18th, 1942, amidst Japan's period of runaway successes in the Pacific and Asia, 
Japan's population were both terrified and angered by a surprise American attack on the sacred home islands by American B-52 Mitchells, led by Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. The bombers took off from the aircraft carrier USS Hornet to attack Japan, but unable to return to the ship, they all flew on to friendly Chinese territory, save for one, which landed in the Soviet Union. Fearing that similar attacks would follow, the Japanese army, which had been waging a brutal campaign in China since 1937, launched Operation Seigo. The objective was to capture the Zhejiang province, which was the only coastal area in China still under Chinese control at the time, and was used by several of the American crews to escape. While Chinese forces in the province were poorly trained and equipped, they did number over a quarter of a million men, and this excluded civilians, who may well decide to resist, knowing the barbaric treatment they could expect from Japanese troops. Therefore, Japanese commanders organized eight whole divisions of troops, numbering 175,000, supported by tanks and aircraft, to sweep them aside, knowing that the quality of the Japanese forces would, as it had previously, tip the balance in their favor. However, the Japanese were not taking any chances, and so it was decided to employ Japan's growing arsenal of biological weapons developed by the scientists at the Japanese Army's notorious Unit 731 to whittle down as much of the enemy population as possible. The Japanese scientists were delighted to be offered the chance to conduct a large-scale field test of their weapons and allow their brutal creativity to flourish in infecting as many people as possible. Aircraft dropped plague bombs, containing fleas infected with bubonic plague. They also spread diseases such as cholera, typhoid, and paratyphoid by infecting local water supplies as well as 3,000 Chinese prisoners who were then released back into their communities so they could continue spreading disease. Chinese record keeping in this period was poor, so exact numbers are hard to establish, but estimates put the number of people who were killed by the Japanese, either through bombing, shooting, or biological weaponry, in the region of a quarter of a million. A Japanese report claimed that biological weapons accounted for 30,000 Chinese military casualties, although this does not include collateral damage amongst the local population. While Japan's scientists viewed the operation a success, it also demonstrated the great threat such weapons presented towards one's own troops. Japanese records showed that some 10,000 of their own troops became ill, after being unintentionally infected by Unit 731's weapons, and of those men, 1,700 would die. Given that Japan was already becoming overextended, fighting the Americans, British, Dutch, and the Chinese across Asia and the Pacific, this was a staggering number to be killed or incapacitated by Japan's own weapons in 1942. It is a stark reminder that although disease can be weaponized, it can never be truly controlled. Compared to its comrade, the Spitfire, the Hawker Hurricane proved far less able to keep pace with the advancement of German fighter technology as World War II progressed, and so was gradually sidelined as one of the RAF's premier fighter types. However, possessing a sturdy and durable airframe, and being a highly stable gun platform, it was decided that the fighter should have a new lease of life as a ground attack platform, with its main quarry being German tanks. This resulted in the Hurricane 2B, which ditched its eight Browning machine guns for four harder-hitting 20mm cannons and underwing bomb racks. Based at RAF Warmwell, number 175 Squadron re-equipped with the ground attack Hurricane on March 3, 1942, and began intensive training to familiarize themselves with their new tactics. Wanting to show off the new warplane to officials and high-ranking officers in the army, whose men would be relying on the close support of the ground attack hurricane, a firepower demonstration was arranged against dummy soldiers and vehicles near the village of Imba on Salisbury Plain, which had been abandoned to support the war effort. Among those expected to attend was Prime Minister Winston Churchill himself, who would be accompanied by US General George Marshall, Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Given the importance of the demonstration, several dress rehearsals were organized, allowing the pilots to practice their attacks, but many guests were still invited to watch them training. On Monday, April 13, 1942, 
a flight of six Hurricanes from number 175 Squadron took off to participate in another of these dress rehearsals at Imba, where a large crowd of observers had settled, waiting for the attack to take place. Previous dress rehearsals had gone off without a hitch, so there was no reason to believe this one would be any different. The weather was dry and sunny, but this had produced a haze, which made spotting the aircraft off in the distance a little more challenging, as they appeared simply as specks. However, it also made the pilots of the Hurricanes have to focus a little harder to follow their leader and eventually find their targets. One of the guests at the demonstration was Michael Richard Foote of the SAS, and he would describe in his memoirs what happened next. Quote, We stood in a long line, perhaps a thousand of us on a down. On the opposite down was an equally long line of lorries, large and small. A hurricane appeared low to our right, heading straight for us. The front of its wings twinkled. I flung myself down instantly. So did most of us. It roared overhead and was gone, followed by cries of stretcher bearer. 25 people were killed and 80 more injured in the hurricane's strafing run. The pilot of the hurricane was 21-year-old Sergeant William McLaughlin, who told the subsequent inquiry that in the hazy environment, he had briefly lost sight of the hurricane he was following, and when he saw the spectators, he believed they were the dummy soldiers he was meant to destroy. He only realized his mistake after he flew over the crowd and saw them running for cover. The incident was blamed on a combination of low visibility and poor judgment on the part of McLaughlin. McLaughlin eventually returned to active flight status, but would be killed just over two months later in an operation over France. The subsequent demonstration for Churchill and General Marshall went off perfectly, and the incident was hushed up, fearing it could damage morale and confidence in the RAF's ability to provide air support. As such, for many years after the war, most of the details surrounding the incident were confused and sometimes contradictory. And it wouldn't be until the unveiling of a memorial plaque at St. Giles' Church in Warminster in 2012 that it finally received formal recognition and truth was revealed. On April 29th, 1944, the US Navy motor torpedo boat PT-346 was operating in conjunction with two other boats. PT-347 and PT-350 near Rubal. PT-346 was under the captaincy of Lieutenant Junior Grade James R. Burke, and in addition to the typical 17 men he had under his command, he had two passengers on board, in the shape of US Army Observer Lieutenant Colonel Pettit and Royal Australian Navy's Lieutenant Eric Howard. That day, they received word that PT-347 had become stranded on a reef and attacked by enemy aircraft. PT-350 had already come to the aid of 347, and its guns had brought down one of the enemy planes, although when it crashed into the sea, the men of the two torpedo boats observed to their horror that the fighters did not bear the large red insignia, identifying it as Japanese. Instead, it had a star and bar. They had been attacked by US Navy Vought F4U Corsairs, which had mistaken them for Japanese boats. The crew of the PT-346 were no stranger to the horrors of friendly fire. Barely a month earlier, on the morning of March 27th, PT-346 came to the rescue of two of its comrades after they'd been attacked in error by aircraft of the Royal Australian Air Force. Both torpedo boats were sunk and eight Americans were killed, with 12 others wounded. Lieutenant Burke and his men arrived on the scene at 1230 hours, and they observed the stranded 347 and the shot up 350 less than three miles from a nearby beach, where ominous figures could be seen watching them attempt to free the stuck boat. There was no mistaking that these were Japanese troops, and Burke was under orders that if the 347 couldn't be recovered from the reef, that the crew were to be taken off and the vessel destroyed. Meanwhile, PT-350 returned to base, having suffered damage to its engines from the Corsairs. After about an hour and a half of trying to free the vessel, the air began to buzz with the sound of aero engines once more. Identifying them as US Navy aircraft, the sailors took comfort in the knowledge that they now had air cover, should the Japanese on shore try to make a move against them. After the previous day's incident, everyone involved in getting the 347 off the reef believed that the pilots by now must have been warned of their location. However, they believed wrong. 
Thinking these were Japanese gunboats, the US planes attacked. Crewman Ollie J. Talley recalled what happened next. Quote, the first bomb went right under my engine room and blew my engines and batteries all out of whack. When I climbed out of there, I saw that the skipper had been mowed down. According to witnesses, Lieutenant Burke had realized they were coming under attack and was waving an eight-foot US flag in the air to try and warn the pilots off when he was struck by machine gun fire. As he lay dying on the deck of his torpedo boats, he was tended to by medic John Frakovic, but Burke, realizing that his time had come and seeing that Frakovic didn't have a life jacket on, ordered the medic to remove his and put it on himself. The medic reluctantly obeyed. The US planes continued their attack, and so the remaining crew decided to abandon PT-346, as did the crew of PT-347, but not before the crew aboard the latter, after being left with no choice, returned fire on the American planes, downing a Grumman F-6F Hellcat. As they readied the life raft, a single bomb struck 346 square in the middle, the force being so great that Tally was literally thrown out of his shoes. Both torpedo boats were destroyed in the attack, leaving the men struggling to try and stay afloat in the water, clinging to bits of debris and even each other. But the horror was not over yet. For nearly an hour, the men were subjected to repeated strafing attacks from passing American planes, killing many more of them in the water. In all, 21 men were killed, with three more having been killed aboard the PT-350 during the earlier incident. After D-Day, and having established their beachhead on the Normandy coast, the Allies then had to contend with a German army descending on their position, fighting tooth and nail to prevent their breakout. The terrain in and around Normandy suited the German defenders, where narrow country lines and tall hedgerows offered ideal concealment for German tanks and infantry, armed with the vaunted Panzerfaust to lay ambushes for Allied armored units. Frustrated by this, US General Omar Bradley, commander of the US First Army, conceived of an operation to blast a hole through the German lines near the village of St. Lo creating a break in the line through which his army could push through en masse and head south, thus encircling the German army, where they could be strangled into submission. It would also put pressure on the western flank of the German forces, who had tied up the British army under Field Marshal Montgomery to the east of Bradley's men. Dubbed Operation Cobra, Bradley called upon the US 8 Air Force and its fleet of strategic bombers to lay waste to a 5km by 2km rectangular area ahead of his troops' positions. Once the bombing run was completed, Bradley's troops would then charge forward, giving the surviving Germans little time to recover, thus allowing him to achieve the breakout he desired. There was some trepidation about the plan, which would involve huge waves of Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress bombers, whose crews were more accustomed to targeting cities rather than providing what was effectively close air support. The 8th Air Force commanders told Bradley that his troops would have to be at least three kilometers away from the target area in order to avoid them being hit by stray bombs, and even that was cutting it fine. Bradley disagreed, however, believing this was too far for his troops to move forward before reaching the area he would need to be once the bombing was completed. After much negotiation, both sides reluctantly settled on a distance of 1.2 kilometers. Bradley had one more stipulation, one which he hoped would limit the risk to his men, and that was for the bombers to fly parallel to the American lines. Bradley believed that with the momentum the bombs would achieve during the fall from the aircraft, they would be less likely to stray to where his troops were positioned, but he was warned by the 8th Air Force that this was no guarantee. On July 24th, 1944, the B-17s began taking off and forming up over their bases before making the flights to Normandy a comparatively short flight for the crews, who by this point in the war were routinely bombarding Germany itself. However, as they approached their target area, they discovered it was concealed by cloud cover, and recognizing the importance of accuracy during this particular mission, with American troops so close by, the bombers were ordered back to England. However, a section of the bombers had already dropped their ordnance onto the target area, and with disastrous results. Despite Bradley's insistence they approach parallel to the Allied lines, the bombers instead approached perpendicular to them, 
and as the bombs fell, some strayed far enough from their target area to land amongst American troops. 25 men were killed in the attack, and out of a cocktail of blind fury and overwhelming sense of self-preservation, the American troops began firing on the American planes. Bradley was furious and demanded to know why the 8th Air Force had ignored his instruction regarding a parallel approach. The reason he was given was that a perpendicular approach would limit the time the bombers were exposed to a nearby German flak battery, and it was reiterated to him that a parallel approach was no guarantee of preventing Allied casualties from the bombing. The next day, the weather improved, and so the bombers took to the air again. Over 1,800 aircraft filled the skies over the target area, comprising of the B-17s and smaller single and twin-engine fighter bombers that picked off specific targets as they appeared, and fighters to prevent the Luftwaffe from interfering. Given the tragedy of the day before, many soldiers took comfort from seeing the fighter bombers strike with great accuracy, but then the B-17s arrived, flying in groups of 12, each one with an assigned leader who would essentially mark the target with their bombs for the others to aim for. And once again, they flew a perpendicular approach. In all, some 12 million pounds of explosives rained down on the target area from both aircraft and military. The once picturesque French countryside was obliterated, becoming covered in ash and peppered with craters, leaving many to remark that the scene resembled the surface of the moon. Over 1,000 German troops, in some cases entire units, were annihilated in the bombardment, and it succeeded in allowing Bradley's forces to eventually push through their lines, although they still faced fierce resistance. However, it quickly became clear that once again, there were Allied casualties as bombs fell on Bradley's troops. The final count on the July 25th bombing was 111 Americans killed and over 500 wounded. If added to the 25 killed the day before, this makes Operation Cobra the worst friendly fire case of the war for American forces. As well as those physically affected, the bombing also saw a dramatic rise in the number of cases of shell shock amongst the survivors. Among those killed in the bombing was Lieutenant General Leslie McNair, who as well as being one of his subordinates, was a close friend of Bradley. McNair's body was found well behind the intended target area, having been blown some 60 feet out of his foxhole. His body was so badly damaged that he was only identified by the rank insignia on his uniform. At that time, he was the highest ranking US officer to be killed in the European theater of war. Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower was furious and demanded an explanation. Blame has largely been put on strong winds, blowing the smoke from bombs dropped by the lead bombers over Allied lines, confusing the follow-up bombardiers, who then released their bombs too early. One can only speculate, if the bombers had flown parallel, as Bradley requested, whether this would have made a difference or not. And there you have five devastating cases of friendly fire in World War II. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.